Hi, I'm Ryan Curtis. I'm the writer and creator of Slums of the Empire City, a new comic book series, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented, not only filmmaker, but a comic uh, writer as well. He's creating a wonderful work that I've just happened to go through. And I'm floored by not only the writing, the art style, the cast of characters. I think you're going to be very happy with this particular project. We're joined, by, joined today by Ryan Curtis, the creator of Slum of the Empire City. How are you doing today, Ryan? Awesome, Kurt. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, great having you on the show. You know, I love new books. I love comics. And that's what this show is all about. It's about showcasing passionate people for their projects. But for those that don't know about Slums of the Empire City, tell us what it's all about. Thank you. Slums is a uh, sort of fictional, sort of non-fictional story that takes place in 1869 New York City. Um, we follow our main character, Sadie the Goat, who apparently was a real person. Uh, according to Herbert Asprey's Gangs of New York novel. And uh, we follow her with her uh, couple cronies as they uh, try to make their way through the dangerous city and, uh, and gang life in New York. Um, it's, it's been a passion project for years. Uh, originally started as a, a TV script, uh, like a pilot script. And uh, when COVID hit and everybody was locked down, I thought, you know what, it would be fun to do something with that. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, so I like to go out and just shoot things and, and you know, write shorts and go and shoot them and have fun. But trying to do 1800s New York in you know, 2021 Vancouver is not easy <laughs> or cheap. So it seemed like, hey, you know what is a open range is comic and people are loving comics right now. I know they're super hot. Kickstarter is blowing up with with comic books and thought this would be a perfect adaptation for a comic book series. We can do whatever we want in the world. And, uh, and we have. And I, I love the fact that you have a great initial cast, like setting the, the tone in the first couple of issues or first couple of pages, I should say, is the best way to draw in a reader, obviously. I mean, as a filmmaker, you understand the necessity of those opening scenes. When you were drafting out this script and writing it out, why are those particular scenes to open up your comic? Actually, those scenes that we open up on are in the television script come about halfway in, in the first episode. So I wanted something that really spoke to who these characters are immediately and got us right into the story. So I think, you know, especially with Sadie, her first line involves a vulgar C word uh, is pretty on the nose for her character being her most characterfulness. Um, and we sort of get right away that she's, uh, she's the boss. She's frustrated trying to get something going. And she has these two lackeys on her arm that are sometimes uh, willing to go along and sometimes not willing to go along. Uh, so to me, it was like, how do we establish them in the first page? So that with their dialogue, we understand exactly where they are in the world and what our world is. It's very hot uh, July 4th day when we, when we open. So put that into context. Uh, and then they jump into a opportunity that presents itself in a very um, juicy way, should we say. <laughs> You're no stranger to showcasing violence, which is, I think, apropos for the time itself. What inspirations did you draw from? Is it because of your, your love of history showcasing that this was a violent time in the world? Or is it just because it was it also from the story? Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of our inspiration, of course, came from Gangs of New York, the Scorsese film, um, and then the book that it was based on. Um, you know, you, you're having a population that's just exploding at this time. Immigrants are coming in by the, literally by the boatloads, and uh, and they're not moving. They are sort of just planting themselves right there in downtown Manhattan, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And with that comes crime obviously and uh, you know unless there's enough work to go around people will resort to desperate measures um and yeah i really like the idea of just these uber violent kids that are just living their life um 
one of the important things to me is I didn't want it to be depressing, you know, although it, it definitely is. If either of us went there, could go back in time, I'm sure we'd leave with, with the tears streaming down our face. But for them, it's just life. It's just what you do. This is how you live. So, you know, I love the, the idea of them tripping through this terribly depressing world, but it totally going over their heads and they're worried about getting drunk that day or, or you know, stealing two bucks from someone and not worried at all about how they're living in absolute squalor. What are the ethics of writing these types of historical figures, whether or not they were, were real or semi-real? It's it's a little tricky. I mean, with Sadie the Goat, no one's ever really showed her in literature. I mean, there's, there's a couple small ones. So you have free range to create a character however you see fit. You know, it was never established how old she was or, or any of these things. So that's easy. Later on in, in f- further episodes in... Uh, Seven, eight, nine, issue seven, eight, nine. We meet Walt Whitman, the American poet, and I know a little bit about Walt Whitman, but I'm certainly not a Whitman historian. So that's where a little bit more research and a little bit more care is going to come into really trying to flesh out and develop who this man was, even though we're putting him in in situations that didn't actually happen. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's important to his legacy to come close to being the man that he was. And part of the reason we're doing that is Walt Whitman was fairly well known for having little patience for Irish immigrants uh, later in the 18, uh, earlier in the 1800s, whereas later he sort of got, uh, he started to understand the plight of the Irish immigrant and what they were going through and eventually became on side with them. So we're sort of using that little piece in our, in our books to, to show a change of, of attitudes of people at the time. You know, looking at, at Gangs of New York as as a, a basis, not only for a film, but as a, as a book itself, was there any other literary pilgrimages that you went on to kind of research the characters you wanted to bring into your books? Well, yeah, there, there's a, 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 a small collection of books about the time period here somewhere. Um, which I did read through and, and found them fascinating. Again, just uh, it's such an interesting, interesting point in time for me. But I think a lot of the stuff came from newspapers. Um, you know, the Smithsonian has a history of newspapers that are completely searchable. They're fairly accurate searches. So, uh, you know, I really wanted to try and find evidence that Sadie the goat was a real person and existed. So I've spent years and years and years going through these. And every so often I'll update, you know, try changing some words and some search terms to see what you can find. I haven't found any evidence that she actually existed yet, but what I did find were so many interesting, crazy happenstance stories that I thought were so great that I and ended up building into the books. And uh, the, for instance, uh, Harmon and Haley, who are uh, Sadie's two uh, colleagues, uh, were I found them in a news story about two men, Harmon and Haley, stealing sugar off of a, a, a ship that was in quarantine, sneaking aboard and stealing baskets of sugar and getting caught by the harbor police and, <laughs> uh, you know, being sent to Sing Sing prison. I thought, well, if there's not two bumbling idiots that, <laughs> that uh, you know, need, uh, need Sadie's help to succeed, uh, I don't know what are. So, you know, so these two men who lived 150 years ago are now in a comic book that they couldn't <laughs> comprehend possibly but here, here they are uh, and living and breathing and you know just taking fun stuff like that little incidents where you read about a chimney collapsing into the street and killing some people that's interesting and 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 weird it's certainly not something well i shouldn't say something we don't see now considering there's been a couple terrible collapses lately but um right. you know something different and okay why not so taking these little news stories from the day and putting them in there has been a lot of fun um, Sadie's family in the in the third book um, run a, an oyster saloon, a low oyster saloon called Farrell's Oyster Saloon, um, was a real place, and those are real real people. Whether they're related to Sadie the Goat or not, I, I, we don't think so. But that was actually taken from some newspaper stories at the time, describing this family and and um, some court cases they went through. So it was like hmm, kind of interesting. So again, just using these little these little pieces to to pull and put together into a bigger story it's it's lots of fun obviously you're an avid reader uh not only from a research perspective but also from it sounds like a personal perspective as well too and it's always wonderful to 
find, you know, uh, ideas through prose and, and through not only fictional writing, but through history itself. Is there any authors that you disliked at first when you were reading growing up, or did you finally change your tune on them in later years? Yeah, I'm, I'm an avid reader for things that interest me, okay. uh, you know, especially in research and, and that sort of thing. I don't really have any, you know, favorite authors other than, you know, the, the usual suspects that are on the bestsellers list. But one thing I, I, I can talk about is the writing in the newspapers of the day is so outlandishly, uh, uh, what would you call it, opinionated. It's, it's farcical and it's so fun to go back and read this stuff and you can just hear the the reporter's voice coming through and and their judgment on these despicable characters that uh, did these crimes of the day there's one about um because uh, sadie became the leader of the charlton street gang um charlton street was a big uh, search term for me trying to find information on that and there's this story about how a man was robbed and killed on charlton street and uh, they're quite sure the Charlton Street Gang was responsible as he was found with over $100 in his pocket and not robbed. So they think it was the gang that did it. And then you go to the same day in a different newspaper and it's quite clear that the man accidentally drowned in the river and had nothing to do with gangs or violence at all. You're thinking, well, geez, I guess that reporter really wanted a better story than he was presented with. So I think that's that's one of the funnest things about uh, this research is reading these uh, these crazy news stories. Obviously, to put a comic book together, you need to have a good team around you, uh, not only as, as a writer, but you need a, a, a solid artist and colorist if, if you went that route as well. Uh, who did you gather to make this comic possible? Kai Robb is our uh, our main artist, our lead artist. He does um, everything from the pencils all the way through to the inks. And then we had Kyra Roca come in and do the color for us. Now, these uh, these are guys I hadn't met before, and I'd only met... K. Rob through Facebook, actually. It was a, a post. And uh, when I decided I wanted to do this comic book, I wanted to find a really good artist. I wanted someone who could really capture the emotion of characters in their faces. That was very important to me. Again, this is going back to my film background where, you know, a look can tell an entire story. And I wanted somebody who could do city and, and uh, urban environments. And I, you know, I probably looked at thousands and thousands of artists who were posting on Facebook or um, Instagram as you know, freelancers and found his work. And I, I found a few others that I thought were really good, but his was my favorite. And so I literally just reached out of uh, the blue. Uh, it was really out of the blue because uh, he didn't know it existed. So I reached out and, you know, he's a star, he's an artist that's just starting out and extremely talented and so easy to work with. And for me, especially being my first comic book, you don't know how much information you should really give the artist. You know, when I wrote the script for these things, the comic script for it, I wanted to sort of give them, here's what I have in my head, but if you have something different, I want to know about that and, and take it to the next level. And they did. Kai Rob really did. He, he brought it out and a lot of the stuff that's in there is just really fantastic. I couldn't be more happy with, you know, his framing and, and his, uh, his use of panels has been uh, really great. So I'm very, very happy with it. Like I said, it's a beautiful book, truly. Like you, if, if this is your, first comic book you've set the bar high because I, I i really think that and i and the fact that you you have seven eight nine books coming out as well too like yeah. just from what i've read this is incredible i definitely want to see this entire series so you know i i, I want to support it anyway i can for oh, sure thank you so much kurt that's that means the world um and i can make the announcement right here on your show we got our kickstarter funding today we hit oh, our goal that's... yeah so that's pretty exciting um, so now hopefully we'll have some stretch goals and, and keep going. We have another, at uh, this date, a, a week and a half. I'm not sure when uh, when this podcast will come out, but uh, that's good. That's that's positive news. So that means that we get to make the next the next few books. Well, I was going to say, you know, a Kickstarter, a Kickstarter campaign, as I've said in the past, is like a full-time job, uh, quite yeah. literally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if you've never done one before, obviously you're putting a lot of time and effort into it. Uh, what challenges did you face in, in not only promoting it, but also gathering what tiers you wanted to select? Well, that, that is the trickiest part. Like I've gone through so many, uh, well, first of all, um, uh, there's there's a few really awesome sites out there that I want to shout out. Global Comics being one. If you are a comic book creator, go to their 
YouTube page for Global Comics, and they have essentially a masterclass on creating, marketing, social media marketing, Kickstarter, everything that they just give away for free to you. So uh, you're a fool if you don't go there and look at it. So many of these tiers that people are offering are just absolutely jam-packed with stuff. Uh, and I don't know how they're making money doing that. <laughs> our books are completed. Um, you know, I paid the artists up front to make them. Even for our Kickstarter, it's about printing. It's about advertisement. It's about marketing. It's about shipping. And even then, we're barely breaking even on what we're charging for uh, books. And some people have books and shirts and figurines and all these other things. I'm thinking, how the heck are you able to make that work? So I think to me, the hardest was giving a, a fair price point for, for printed books and being able to still actually afford to do that. Um, and I kept it really simple. We had um, digital tiers and then uh, one print tier. And then after that, the, the bigger ones where people can put themselves in the book where the artist will draw a picture of you and you'll be in the book or uh, add you as a character to our next books, which is fun. Uh, I think two people have taken that one. So they'll actually be characters with names and nice. you know conversations in the next book. So that's pretty exciting. I'd be remiss to say if I didn't dive into yourself as a filmmaker uh, and being in the industry that I'm definitely passionate about as well, too. I mean, I wouldn't go to school for four years if I didn't enjoy it. Um, as, a, as a person in the film industry, what is your, your roles, for first off, and um, what do you enjoy about the industry? I'm what they call a visual effects supervisor, so I work on television and movies. I work with the directors and the, and the writers and the producers to plan what all the visual effects will be in a, a film or a show. And then I go to set and work with the film crew and the directors to make sure that everything that we're shooting lines up with what we've planned. And I have all the parts that I need to put it together later on. And then in post, I work with a team of artists to actually create those visual effects and implement them into the movie so that they look seamless. Um, I mean, I love all parts of that because it's it's creative on so many different levels, whether it's creative on planning, uh, problem solving, artistic, uh, film making, um, you know, understanding how to make films is a pretty important part of that. Um, or, you know, even if it's just working with people and working through communication issues and stuff like that, it's fun on every level. Uh, and then, of course, being able to see your stuff on TV or on the big screen is super exciting. Um, but I love working with all these awesome creative people. You know, I've worked with lots of showrunners who, um, or writers that write comic books for the big, you know, the big three and, you know, have some really big titles under their belt. And so just to be able to know these people and say, hey, how do I do this? You know, I, and I did that when I started out. I, I contacted a couple of them and said, hey, how do I write a comic book script? And, uh, you know, and they would send me a couple comic book scripts that they wrote for these big, huge uh, comics. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I figured. So, you know, it, it's it's just having access to that creativity and that fun, I think, is the, the best. And I love making films as well. Like I said, if, if this wasn't set in the 1800s, I'm sure I would have probably made it uh, or pieces of it by now. You know, I, I would love to see a, a, a version of this if you ever decide to go live action. Or even, heck, you could even do a short film and it would still be pretty amazing, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but as a filmmaker, as now a, a writer, you know, did you think you've expanded your creativity to its fullest extent or do you have more to give? Always got more to give. Always, always, always. It's never enough. It's always more and more and more. Um, you know, it, last year I... Um, executive produced a film, a short film, where I didn't write it and I didn't direct it. I just produced it. And I never wanted to produce before, had no interest in being an EP. And then, and then next thing you know, I am. Because why not? You got to try it. You got to do, see if it, if it speaks to you. When I got into this, the film business, I actually thought I wanted to be an editor. And I, and I, I still really enjoy editing. Um, so when I got in, I got in as a visual effects editor and then every step of the way was always, well, I like what I'm doing, but I'm not sure I'd want to do that next thing until I did it. And then I said, oh, I like this, but I'm not sure I want to do that next at all the way, all the way up. So including this one where, oh, I, I don't think I ever want to be an executive producer. And then I did it. 
I, I don't think I want to do it again, but, <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, it was a challenge and uh, we shot a really cool short film, which should be coming out soon called The Blackter. It's sort of a, a Black Lives Matter uh, piece that uh, a writer, director, actor uh, friend whom I worked with on a, a show, she wanted to direct and, and, uh, and we'd been talking about it for a long time and eventually said, well, why haven't you directed yet? And she said, because I keep having producers that are dropping out. And I said, okay, well, I'll produce it. So yeah, we worked together and I mean, it took us over a year, but we put a movie together and it's a, uh, it's a great one. Being a creative person, obviously you're going to have challenges, not only in life, but in the process itself. Um, how do you manage writer's block if you have it? Well, and how do you manage say an issue with visual effects? Like, are they similar in terms of your process or? Yeah. I mean, sometimes you get into a visual effects where you communicate to an artist to say, okay, I really want this to be laser beam to be really chaotic and red and it should feel like it's coming from the death star and go. And then you come back and it's nothing like that and it doesn't quite work. And so you give notes and, and usually you, you, you pile around, but sometimes you just run out of, you run out of ideas, you run out of different ways of, of saying it. So usually in those kinds of situations, it's a wholesale change, uh, go with a different artist, use different language, use different ways of describing it. And, um, you know, I really like to see the artists do the art very similar to what this book was. I don't want to tell you exactly how to do your job. I want you to show me the talent that you obviously have from being here. So sometimes that's, that's what it is with writer's block. I don't know if I'm unique in this, but traditionally I have a whole plot in my head before I sit down to write. So I might come up with an idea about, uh, hey, this werewolf movie would be a cool idea. I'd love that. And I'll start chewing on my head. And sometimes it takes years of just chewing through this idea before it comes out. Um, right now, issue five of this comic book is half written just because I'm not sure where I want to go next. And instead of sitting in front of a blank page waiting, I just sort of chew it in the back of my mind while I'm doing the rest of my life. And uh, some t somehow it just says, ah, I know how I'm going to fix that and then jump back into it. <laughs> Hopefully. But I, I, I've never had to say someone say, okay, great, write 150 pages and have it to me by next week. That's That seems scary to me. Yet you'll work on a series, you know, that's loved by millions. And yeah, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, in terms of, in terms of your geekiness, in terms of your, your love of film and, and love of the media that you consume, whether it's comic books or whatever you consume, um, what are some of your, your most favorite genres to go to for creativity? And what are your least favorite? so funny you know i work in visual effects you would think it would be huge set pieces of, of crazy carnage and stuff but it's really not to me inspiration is from those very quiet moments between actors I, i'm i'm a sucker for actors and for characters and for those subtle moments of um uh, of realism and f where you really start to feel what you're supposed to feel in, in a situation that that is the most exciting part for me as, as weird as that is um I'm not so, uh, you know, I, I think that my, my preference is television. I, I sort of grew up on TV as a TV addict. Uh, films obviously are really cool. And, and I like art house filmed all the way up to Marvel movies. But uh, I think it's just those character moments that are really the, the best for me. What's, what's one that, that you always go to and you kind of get a tear in your eye that's just like, man, that was just amazing? I think... Uh, and this one's just popping into my head right now in the abyss when um, uh, the female character drowns and uh, and what's his name's trying to bring her back to life. And I don't know if you remember that scene, but that's yeah, a yeah. pretty pretty emotional, powerful scene. And there's a you know there's a million of them, of course. Or um, you know, gangs in New York with uh, Daniel D. Lewis saying pretty much just anything is is epic as far as I'm concerned. Cool. I, I was curious. It's always fun to see uh, the level of. of what you're interested in too because you, you never know with this type of show you yeah. if you grew up on on tv so if, if star trek was your thing or star wars when that yeah. came out or yeah. or um you know even going to the cartoons of the 80s if you're into that of stuff course well, all too. that stuff yeah less now obviously but at the time <laughs> i was you know i remember when the first time i ever went on the internet all right here's geek knowledge for you this is probably in 93 mm -hmm. 
yeah, probably 92 or 93. The very first thing that I did, my dad had it and I was visiting and I went to, uh, to the star Wars news group, alt.binaries.starwars. And I mean, they weren't binaries. It was just like text chat, uh, you know, in the news groups. I know that 90% of, well, maybe not this show, but uh, most people out there don't even know what news groups are, but yeah, that was the first thing I did because at the time nobody talked about star Wars. I mean, it was like if you went to a party and uh, and you met a, a guy who knew you know who I don't know who, who uh, yeah, salacious B Crumb was you, you end up talking in the corner all night about geeky Star Wars stuff because it was so rare it seemed that way for for me so uh, to it see was. where yeah right right but to see where Star Wars is now is 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 insane you know or or Star Trek Next Generation I mean we used to watch it after school every day and. Uh, and now it's cool seeing people that are going back to it and they're like, Oh, wow, this is really good. And you're like, yeah, that's, that's when writing on TV was good. They don't take those chances now. I, I don't think they can. I mean, no. to be honest, they, they just don't have the culture of, of media has changed almost indefinitely to the necessity of being inclusive. Obviously that, that is something that was sorely lacking in those decades, obviously, but it was, they can't take chances because I, I, I mean, you're in the industry. I'm just taking speculation here <laughs> uh, that it, it might be conceived the wrong way, even if it has good intentions behind. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's and there's, you know, the thing about next generation is there's a lot of gray area stuff that people nowadays wouldn't stand for. I think, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know the the prime directive or, or whatever the heck they're doing uh, uh, on that monster of the week, but um, yeah, I, I would love to see more of that, more uh, more heady type stuff on on TV than we see now. When did your life change for the better? When I met my wife, for sure. She's in the room. Just make sure that she can hear that in the other room. <laughs> if she didn't hear your side, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, and I, I wish, you know, I don't actually, I don't wish, but that's absolutely true. When I met my wife, I was at my, the lowest point in my life and she was, uh, a very, she was very successful and, and, uh, and I wasn't, and that literally was the turning point. And, uh, it's just gotten better and better and better. And every year seems to get better and better. And there's some down, some, some slow periods and some sad stuff when, you know, people, you lose people in the family and things like that. But yeah, it's that's been gradual, better and better since then, and that was in 1995. So it's been a, a long up road. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Being in the various industries that you are, you're now comic book. Uh, you're in the comic book genre as well mm -hmm. as the uh, film industry. What is the wisest person someone has ever said to you? Um, that f failure is just saying that you tried and don't be afraid of those failures because anybody who's failed means that they are trying to achieve something. So it's when you are too afraid to fail that you're not going to move forward. So I think that's probably it because what the hell am I doing making a comic? I don't know any, I don't know the first thing about comics for the most part and certainly not selling them and advertising them and marketing them and getting into the industry and art. So why the hell am I doing that? And it was basically just to see if I could. And and yeah, it absolutely could fail. But if you fail, it only means that you tried. What is one mistake that you'll never, ever do again? Um, hmm. Oof, that's a really tough one. What is one mistake that I would never, ever do again? I don't know. I don't know. That's really that's a really great question. I don't I don't think about my mistakes too often. Um, huh? Um, probably cheat on a significant other. How about that? Again, just so that she could find the other. <laughs> She's gonna walk in and think, "What the hell are you? What are you, are you talking about?" <laughs> I'm being asked questions by this guy across the Canada. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's all his fault. No, we don't need to go to therapy. <laughs> Is it easier to love or hate and why? Um, oh, I think it's much easier to love. You know, that's, you, 
people always talk about how crappy people are. Well, anyone who's worked, especially anyone who's worked customer service, I'm um, with you, my brothers and sisters and others. I uh, I worked customer service for many, many, many years. I worked uh, for a big cable provider and it's tech support for many, many, many years. But I think we all agree that 90% of people are great. They're fine. They're normal, happy, go lucky, everyday people. 5% are kind of grumpy and you try to avoid them. And then 5% are just miserable people that you don't want anything to do with. So those are the people that you hate, 5% out of 95%. So yeah, I think it's a lot easier to love because there's lots to love about that 95% of people. And most of it is that they're not the other 5%. <laughs> it's a good positive outlook. I like that. Yeah. I did customer, I did tech support for um, Lenovo and then AT&T Uverse for 24 seven call center for three and a half years of my life. That was, you know, the pain. Yes. I just talked to my mother-in-law, 75 year old mother-in-law and nieces trying to get their TV working, their Roku box working. And uh, I got off the phone and my wife's like, are you okay? I'm like, flashbacks, <laughs> PTSD. <laughs> Uh, I had a six and a half hour call with a guy from Chicago trying to resolve their, his technical issues. He wouldn't let me hang up because he didn't think I'd call him back. Yeah. So I had to call him every time. But I also found that the extent of the recording software was four hours. So I was <laughs> fine over. <laughs> That's a nice little trick. You know, I if we have time, I'll share a, yeah, yeah. a little thing. So yes, I mean, 90, well, I wouldn't say 70% of, of all those calls you take are so mundane and boring, but a few of them stick out for me. One was this old guy called and you know, he was probably in his eighties. Like he was really old. And he said, I, you know, I've called five or six times and I was sort of like the next level of, of uh, tech support. So not the inbound, but you know, the escalated yeah. desk. Yeah. And he's like, I want to watch Turner classic movies with my wife, but she's going deaf. So we want to, we want the closed captioning. I'm like, okay, well that's easy. He's like, well, I turn on closed captioning and it's not working. And, you know, I, of course I turn it on there and it's working just fine. I'm like, well, it's working on our end. So, you know, you, you just must not have the button. So I spent the time with him going through it, going through it with the buttons. And sure enough, he was turning it on and he would go to other channels and it would be there, but he went to his Turner Classic and it wouldn't be there. And so we're like, well, what the hell's going on? So I spent hours and hours and hours with the man and eventually called him back three or four times over the course of a week just to try and get this going because he said it's the only thing that him and his wife can do together is watch these old movies and you know she's slipping away but when she watches these old movies it brings her happiness and joy and stuff so i said god damn it i'm fixing this effing problem and so i did and i escalated all the way to the top of you know the technical and eventually found one old guy way down in the basement and he's like oh yeah, it could be that you're using the blah, blah, blah standard instead of the blah, blah, blah standard. And we can just change that here and did. And I called the man back and he was crying on the phone. He was so grateful and you did it. Now my wife and I can watch this stuff together. So, uh, so it's not all bad. Sometimes there's some good things you can come out of it. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, alive or dead, anyone in history you could have dinner with, who would that be? Um, Sadie the goat. Hmm. See if she's real, huh? Yeah, see if she's real and see what she has to say. I bet she'd be a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that I've missed that we haven't touched on that you'd like to, to share? Oh, yes, there is. You know what? There's one thing I haven't shared, which I should, is uh, it's part of the Kickstarter is, and this is going back to me being a filmmaker and not being able to leave things alone, is I went through and hired a bunch of voice actors to actually voice act the comic book. So all three comic books, we have an audio version of with some professional voice actors. So one of the add-ons for when you uh, uh, back our Kickstarter is to get the audio version of the comic too. So that's kind of cool. And I don't think a lot of people have done that. And it's pretty fun to listen to all these voices. And then as soon as you hear Sadie, you're like, that's now what she sounds like forever. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I love I love radio plays like that. That's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's it's so far underused these days. But I, I, you're the only second one that I know of that has created a radio drama s recently. That's pretty cool. Uh, I don't know how radio it is because you'll still have see the pictures mm -hmm. of the comic. But um, you know, I didn't 
I didn't get someone to read the in between. Hmm, maybe we could. Audio only. Just Anyways, like, yeah, ideas. Do you have a, a good narrator voice? Me? No, but you can find them on Fiverr for pretty cheap. So. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Oh, who was that for me? Um, it's this random person who doesn't even know I exist, actually. It's um, this woman, and it was from years ago, and I was just on some, you know, just surfing some Omegle or something like that. And I just came across this girl, this girl, this lady, and she was talking, and she was talking about how, uh, oh, she had just directed this, this little film, the short film. And that blew me away. I'm like, well, what do you mean you directed it? Like, she's like, oh, yeah, I, I put together a crew and, you know, wrote this and we went out and shot it. And now I have this movie. And that blew my brains that, oh, yeah, you could just go and do it. You don't have to wait for somebody's permission. You could just go and put together a crew and shoot something. And now you're a director with the film. And that that really changed the way I thought about a lot of stuff, including this, uh, making a comic book. Uh, you can just do it. From a professional perspective, you've, you're in the industry of, of entertainment. You have been on film sets. You've been on TV shows. You have also created a comic book. So professionally, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I am successful and fortunate and still striving. Personal success to me is having people that love you and loving others and being welcomed into other people's lives. And I have all that. I got no complaints. So highly successful, personally. Personality wise, well, that's a different story. I mean, that's a work in progress. <laughs> that's a work in progress for life. That's, that's yeah. nothing easy about that. That's right. Jeez. I was an introvert and now I was forced myself to be a, a host of a, a show for 12 years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's just glutton for punishment right there. That is. <laughs> The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Um, usually I get mopey and depressed about them. <laughs> and then my wife will say something inspirational like, well, at least you tried. And then I will tell her, you're stupid. You don't know. And then, <laughs> and then I mope about it for a few days and then realize, yeah, okay, what's next? What's the next step? Let's get that behind us and get moving on to the next thing. Um, and again, like I talked before, you know, failures only mean that you tried. So what did you do different or what can you do different next time? Or, you know, and especially sometimes, you know, whether you're just putting yourself out there too much and that happens a lot too, right? You reach for too much and sometimes you, you, you bite off more than you can chew and, and you just start realizing, okay, well, let's limit that and let's focus on what's achievable and what we can do and what what the, the next success is it's when you start having a failure after failure after failure that i think that it gets really difficult but one failure in between 10 successes that ain't nothing the younger generation is looking at your work not only in the entertainment industry but also at this comic book and they're becoming inspired to be creative themselves whether it's a writer an artist or whatever they'd like to be creatively how can they inspire the generation that follows them Uh, just make, make, make things. Don't make, ex don't make excuses, make things. Um, just show them that it doesn't take a special you know, degree or diploma to, to show that you can be successful or that you can make things. You just go and do it and you get your hands dirty and make it better than the, the people before you. You can, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal and challenge, uh, challenge the next uh, generation to, to do better and, and build better and become more art, artful. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's the best way to do it. In one sentence, who are you? I'm a filmmaker and creator and a relatively good person. I I would be remiss if I did not ask this question. If your life was a movie, what would its title be? If my life was a movie, what would its title be? Or a TV show. Sure. <laughs> or comic book. Um, modernity. I don't know. What? Modernity. 
<laughs> Do I have to look up dictionary.com for that uh, word? Because yeah, I'm... let's both look it up so that we know. <laughs> the state or quality of being modern. Yeah, I stand by my Mod I stand by Mod my <laughs> Modernism in time of spirit. Yeah, yeah. okay. Sure. sure. Okay, sounds that good. That works. I have just learned a new <laughs> word for Scrabble. So well. <laughs> That ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. But before I let you go, where can we find you on social media and how can we help support your comic? My Twitter is Ryan underscore Curtis. You can go to at Slums Comic on Instagram or on Twitter. Uh, and on those, there'll be links to our Kickstarter, which runs until July 28th, the 29th. We've hit our goal, like I said, but we still need more. It's, you know, we're funding the next episode. So uh, anything will help. You can put yourself in the comic you can just get a couple digital editions and everything in between so uh and like and share this podcast and 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 the links to that because i just need to get out in the comic industry more and, and meet more comic readers and get it into their hands so that they can say oh this is fun i like this adventure um you know although we're funded it still still needs readers so it can't just be my friends and family. It has to be uh, comic book readers too. So uh, share and like, and uh, and please let me know what you think. I, I'm happy to to hear about uh, what you what you guys are experiencing when you read that. Beautiful. That that's amazing. I I I mean, congratulations. First off, it is a success. You have successfully done a Kickstarter. That is not something many people can say. So. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I never have to do it again, although I probably will. <laughs> you will. You've, you've now gone down the rabbit hole of crowdfunding, so exactly. this is now your second life. You're right. <laughs> As I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Weeks Talking. Of course, support Ryan, support this comic book, support everything that he is doing in the future for his budgeting career, second career, as now a comic book writer. And uh, I look forward to having you on in the future for your next projects, whether it's this continuation of this book for your next campaign. Please come back. I'd love to have you on. We'll dive more in depth to your, your life as now a seasoned comic book writer. <laughs> right. And, uh, and we'll go from there. Um, but like I said, you can find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com, as well as our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgt media of course we also have the url which is two geeks talking.com and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that story out thank you for listening and watching and i can't wait to see you on another episode of two geeks hey all kurt sasso here from two geeks talking if you like this video and these quick clips here make sure you take a look at our youtube channel youtube.com forward slash tgt media make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well hit the bell to make sure you get notifications of course from videos like this here thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented creative people in the entertainment industry i'm your host kurt sasso thank you so much